So Ed Lockman, you've uh, reunited with Todd Haynes for the film Wonderstruck. Uh, it's a really interesting movie because uh, there's so little dialogue in it, so so much of it relies on visual storytelling. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges of making essentially a silent movie? Well, I like to think of it as uh, the images are about hearing with images. We're dealing with two characters, one in the 20s, one in the 70s, and we're interconnecting the two stories through cinematic language, one black and white silent period of Rose, and the boy, uh, we, we reference kind of the neorealism of the films in the 70s coming out of New York, like Mean Streets or French Connection. And so uh, the, the idea was, how do you encapsulate the reality of, or losing the objectivity of the sound world in images to evoke the feeling in the viewer of what it must be like for a deaf person to perceive their environment. Because obviously, in a lot of ways, when you lose a sense, you become heightened in your other senses. And that's what I was trying to, you know, do with Todd, is create another, you know, reality for the viewer about how you experience deafness, but through the images. It's also interesting because you say that uh, because it also allows you to do something that, that you and Todd Haynes do a lot is that you use filmmaking techniques of the era that you're setting the movie in in order to uh, convey the period, or in this case, to convey um, the perceptions of the character. Can you talk a bit more about that? Well, Todd does look books and then he uh, has us bring references, and it, it isn't just the cinematic language of the time, but also the sociological, the historical. Um, and in the sense of the 20s, it was the roaring 20s up until 29. So there was a certain opulence about the images. There was, it was actually the height of the silent period with filmmakers like Max Office, but you know, we referenced King Vidor, the cr uh, crowd, or uh, the last laugh by Murnau. So the, the 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 camera was very orchestrated. There was sure scuro studio lighting balance. For it was a formalistic look of a cinematic world that fit her character, but and also came out of the book that Brian Selznick wrote, which was an illustrated. It was partly illustrated, partly in words, and he made her world. He wanted the viewer to experience what her world was like being deaf, so he did it in black and white drawing. So that was a perfect metaphor for the silent period that he referenced. And then in the 70s, it was about a young boy who becomes deaf, and you're, and you're cutting back and forth between the two worlds, and you're trying to figure out what creates this mystery, what, what's the connection between the two worlds. And so that was a perfect ploy to use to, and also to look at what New York was like. You know, this boy is coming from a rural area of Minnesota, and New York was very uh, frightening and foreboding there. It was a, in a recession. The social services were broken down in New York, and there was a hardship to the images. So we wanted to encapsulate that in, like, the realism of the French Connection. It's funny, some of the movies you're referencing uh, for this movie, uh, like The Crowd and The French Connection, it's not the typical kinds of films you would think of uh, to be emulating for a movie about children. Um, so I wonder, I mean, I, that kind of unconventional uh, children's film, um, can, can you talk a bit more about, about doing an, an unconventional children's movie? I mean, were you looking at movies about children as references as well, or...? Well, Todd, we looked at the miracle worker because I actually dealt with a, a character that was uh, deaf. But uh, he wanted the film, and I think he wanted a, a certain uh, respect and uh, to the intelligence of the children. And we've tested this film on many occasions in our earlier cuts with children, and they get the story through the emotions of the story. So I, they don't have to understand what we're referencing. 
for them to connect to basically an orphan story about we're all looking for our own identity and our and who we are and the, and and like I say, it really came out of the book, the Wonderstruck. Mm -hmm. So, uh, shooting in black and white, you've done this before, uh, notably on I'm Not There. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges of shooting in black and white? Because, I mean, a lot of people probably don't realize it requires a whole different kind of, of lighting setup, the colors you have to be very careful of. Can you talk a, a bit about that? Well, you know, we had, like you mentioned, we had shot I'm Not There in black and white. And generally, you know, people are shooting it back then, color film. We're now shooting digitally and making it a monochromatic image, a black and white image. But we realized when we shot I'm Not There, and when I even went through the DI, the grain structure is different, the exposure latitude is different, which all adds to the feeling that you're really referencing the period that you were shooting, you know, and shooting certainly referencing the silent period, silent movie period. So it was important that we shoot in the cinematic language of the times and use the similar tools. So I reached out to Kodak and I found out that they were still had in their catalog double X negative. They had discontinued plus X. So I, I asked them, could they make me the film again? And they were very compliant and they, they actually made the film. Then the problem was to have a lab, and I got a lab in Los Angeles, Photochem, to dedicate a machine to develop black and white negative. Everybody thought we were a little crazy, but I'm really glad that we did that. Uh, when it came to, uh, as you say, recreating uh, the kind of gritty feeling of films like The French Connection for the 1970s segments of the movie, can you talk a little bit about, about the uh, visual techniques that you used in order to recreate that? Well, we, we, I reached out to actually Owen Rosman, and uh, he was at the height of his career then. You know, he had shot like uh, Three Days of the Condor, uh, and The Exorcist. He, he was the premier cameraman in the 70s. What was so unusual about the French Connection was the gritty realism, and he was shooting with a much slower film stock than we normally are used to shooting with the 5254 was like ASA 100. They were pushing it to stop. So I tried to use a lot of the same, again, tools that he was using. He was using a Western dolly, which is for, you know, nomadic tires on a platform that you would place a tripod on. So they could do these long tracking shots. They're shooting very quickly. They're shooting hand hold. So we, we tried to do the same, we tried to implement the same kind of apparatus in the techniques. We made a, a wheelchair dolly, we called the rickshaw dolly, we hand hold with longer lenses, we used zoom lenses. I pushed modern stocks uh, that I had, uh, 5219 and uh, 250 daylight um, to capture more of a grain. And then the, the color rendition I tried to uh, implement by shooting daylight film indoors and tungsten film outdoors. So I was trying to play with the color temperatures. So I did everything possible because back then I've, I realized or found out that they were a lot of the print orders, they were printing on Fuji print stock. And there was a difference in the quality of the image where the shadows went magenta and the highlights went yellow green so i tried to also mimic that just to give all the kind of an emotional response to the subject right was there ever uh, a fear that maybe uh these two different styles wouldn't fit together into the same movie or were there visual techniques that you used in order to um connect them in a way or, or was it just Keeping them well, separate was God made the conceit that obviously in the black and white period they were shooting full academy or one three three, in which there is one scene within our black and white story where Rose goes to a movie theater to see her mother, who's a silent screen actress. And his conceit was that we would shoot in two four oh for the black and white period 
and the color period, the 70s. And that way we would feel it was one film when you're cutting back and forth between the two worlds. And then it was obviously the editing, the music that really, you know, reinforced that it was one story that we were talking about and how they answer each other's story. And can you also talk a bit about um, showing the world visually through this, the child's perspective? I mean, it, you know, you're so focused on uh, the children throughout this movie, and, and I think the camera's always sort of at their level for most of it. So can you talk a little bit about showing the world through a child's perspective visually? Well, you know, there's aspects of the film where you're seeing these dioramas, you're seeing miniatures, and it's part of, like, reinforcing the child's world, their own imagination. I mean, to me, the film is really about how you encapsulate a child's imagination and their own language, it be it de in the deaf world or in the hearing world. And so I think that feel, things felt handmade, even, even our, our miniatures that we did with a snorkel camera, a, a, with motion control, we shot that live action. We didn't do digital techniques to create this imaginary world for the children. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, as we've been talking about this, you know, you, you bring up Fujifilm and, and Kodak. You and Todd have continued to shoot on film uh, in this age of digital filmmaking. Uh, you're one of uh, many people who are continuing to shoot on film as opposed to digital. Can you talk a little bit about uh, why you continue to shoot on film as, as opposed to digital? Well. Look, I don't want to be reactionary, and the digital world is here to stay. And actually, 15% of this film was shot digitally in the museum. I was very limited with the amount of time and lights I could bring in and out of the museum every day and night. You know, I would come in in the night after they closed, and I had to get out in the morning. So that was one of the reasons. I did tests. I could have shot on film, but because of the amount of equipment we we thought that would be a more expedient way of shooting. But for me, you know, the, the grain structure, even though that we use things like live grain, but the color depth of the image, I still prefer film. I, I like to reference kind of like in different painting periods, you know, let's say Impressionism or uh, German Expressionism or photorealism, they all had different techniques to accomplish their visualization of their ideas. And I just don't want to limit the tools that we as image makers and cinematographers have to tell our stories. And I think some stories are very well told digitally, and I think other stories can be told well through film. I did not know that some of that was shot uh, digitally. I have to say that that blends very well. Um, so congratulations on that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you and, and Todd Haynes have worked together uh, since Far From Heaven. You've done I'm Not There, Mildred Pierce, Carol, Now This. What is that collaboration like between the two of you? Well, I like to think they say it's a marriage, but I like to think of it's more like a dance partner, that you're hearing the same music, and are you in the same step with each other? So because of our experience together, we seem to be good dance partners. And I mean, you've also worked with, uh, uh, he brings along the same team mostly. Uh, Sandy yeah, Mark Freeberg. Coster. Yeah, Mark Freeberg is a wonderful production designer. Sandy, I try to work with the same crew. My gaffer, John DeBlau, and the operator, Craig Hagenson, and my grip, Jimmy McMillan. So we're all very familiar with each other and both Todd and I's, our background is in, you know, we went to art school. And so, you know, we have the same visual kind of references when we can talk about the style. And, and you know, he's always trying to experiment and approach each story in a different way. And that's, I find that very compelling. And uh, for your work with him, you've received Oscar nominations for Far From Heaven and Carol. Uh, Emmy nomination for Mildred Pierce. What has that recognition meant for you in your career? Well, you're just trying to make it through your day. <laughs> you know, th those things happen after the fact, that, but they aren't the primary reason why you're doing what you're doing. 
I, I'm always surprised by those acknowledgments. Uh, I was present uh, at the uh, American Society of Cinematographers Awards, I believe it was this last year, you were presented mm -hmm. with a Lifetime Achievement Award, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of your uh, clips from your decades-long work was shown, people like Ben Benders and Steven Soderbergh and Todd Salons and, of course, Todd Haynes. So um, I guess what did that honor mean for you being recognized by your peers in that way? And I mean, what have you learned over your decades of work uh, that uh, has benefited you now? Well, uh, look, it was a great honor, and it was a, a chance for me to honor the people that have supported me. And I, I tried to reiterate that in my speech, you know, different people in the industry that supported me on a personal level and also, you know, on a, you know, the camera houses, you know, the, we don't get there all on our own, you know. And um, what did it mean to what, what's the, what, what's I'm going to reposition? I see I don't like this camera position. Right. <laughs> Always the cinematographer then. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, right. I was I was a little too close to the camera. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, what did it did it mean for you to have that recognition? Uh, it was kind of an out of body experience, you know. Um, I I. I I've always I said this I guess I always felt like I'm an outsider and now I I was now kind of the insider looking out so it, it was a, a humbling experience. <laughs> well, uh, Ed Lockman, it's always a pleasure to uh, talk with you and uh, congratulations on Wonderstruck. It was a pleasure. All right, maybe I'll make a better shot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like that angle. <laughs> all right, let me do the interview like this next time. All right. <laughs> Good idea, yeah. <laughs> Have a Bye. good one. Bye. You're welcome. Bye.